This is How About That Podcast, a show dedicated to all things Dallas Cowboys. With both objective and subjective perspectives, How About That Podcast is your place to hear about America's team. Now, here's Joseph Hoyt and Danny Morales. So, I used to have a ton of flight anxiety. Like, I, it, it used to be bad. Like, one time, Danny, I was on, like, an early morning flight, and it was cold outside, and I'm sitting in the back, and I look up with, like, the, the uh, you know, where they put the bags and stuff, and there's that steam coming off because it's cold outside, and, like, it happens all the time. It's a very normal thing. But there's, like, all the steam coming out, and we're, like, taking off, and all of a sudden, I'm just like, hey, is anyone else seeing this? <laughs> like, like, there's smoke coming from the plane. And all of a sudden, a flight attendant, like, unbuckles the thing. It's up. She's like, shh. She's like, it's okay. That happens. That happens. So I'm like, okay. So I've kind of learned to go with the flow, especially to trust the flight attendant's demeanor on flights. But the other day, I had a flight from San Francisco to Dallas. Hold on. Was there smoke inside the plane or outside the plane? You lost Inside the plane. It, it's, it's something with, like, if it's cold outside, it's like a defrosting kind of thing, basically. It happens. I, I've seen it now on multiple flights. Like it, at the grocery store when they like missed the vegetables? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, no, nah, that, that's an apples and oranges situation mm. there. But um, Sorry, continue. Yeah, okay. Um, so long story short, I've learned to trust flight attendants' demeanors and all that stuff. But I had a flight from San Francisco to Dallas. Okay. And we, d- we knew the weather was bad in Dallas. We got delayed for hours. We finally get on the plane. We're on the runway or on the tarmac waiting for about an hour. Me and Catherine, my fiance, are like, hey, we're not we're definitely not taking off tonight. We're already planning to stay in San Francisco one more night. And they're like, all right, we're going to take off. And I was like shocked. I was like, "Okay, I guess we're going to do it. I knew the weather was really, really bad in Dallas, but I was like, all right. So with like 45 minutes left in the flight, Dan and Joey, I look out my window and all of a sudden, like, um, it felt like a mile away. It was probably farther than that, but it felt like just like a mile away. I see purple lightning just like cra- like right, like a mile away, like right in our vision, the same height above the clouds as our plane. And I was like, oh my God. And I'm f- kind of freaking out. I start saying, hey, all my areas. I'm like, oh, what's going to happen? It's going off constantly. It's like every four seconds. It was like crazy lightning, so close. And Nothing happened, obviously. I'm still here. Flight landed okay. But that blew my mind. I Have you guys seen lightning before? <laughs> like, while you're flying? Like, it was sketch. I've seen lightning. Uh, I don't know what this purple lightning you're talking about is. This is new to me. I thought it was like a Power Ranger, come, you know, being bored or something. I think that's what happens when, you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if lightning comes in the shade of purple. Are you sure it was lightning? What else could it have been? A UFO activity? I don't know. Oh. That's, Joey? It's, it's possible. Uh, uh, you know, purple, I feel like purple is one of those like tertiary lightning colors. Like if you were to like rank the colors that you would associate with lightning, I feel like it'd probably be like six or so maybe. I don't know. I don't have the, I don't have the order of operations in front of me, but purple lightning makes sense in my brain. I also, it was late. I was tired. You know, maybe I was just saying things. Um, could have been delusional. Could have been. I almost, I nearly pulled the, like, is anyone else seeing this thing that I pulled when the first time I saw steam coming out of the baggage area of the plane? But I didn't. How are you with uh, turbulence on planes? I, I'm good now. I Like I said, I used to have a lot of flight anxiety. Um, but basically, I got exposure therapy that way. So turbulence doesn't really bother me that much. I always, if I see, like, Flight attendants stressing. That's when I start to get a little like, uh oh, you know, these people that do this every day are kind of stressed. But have you ever flown out of Palm Springs? No. Cool airport though. I've heard it's a sick airport outdoors. Super, super cool outdoors. But like you're taking off. Yeah, when you're taking off, you're going through. I believe it's the Coachella Valley. So you're literally taking off in a valley, coming through it, and then coming out of it. But it's just a wind tunnel, and they put a bunch of windmills there to generate energy. And it's all small planes coming out of there, so your plane is just rocking the whole time. And uh, it didn't; it wasn't very reassuring when we were boarding the plane, and I was watching the older pilot explain to the younger pilot, who looked brand new, like where certain buttons were and how to do certain things. That's not really what you want to see as you're about to board a plane. And then when the turbulence start kicking in, I was really scared. But again, like you just said, a couple of hail, hail marys and uh, smooth sailing. 
I I think flying is one of the craziest things in terms of like the human reaction because the statistics the statistics are you're more likely to get in an struck accident by, struck by purple lightning struck by purple lightning than uh, something to happen bad with your plane right but it is so terrifying when and jarring when things start to go a little awry um, beyond normal turbulence yeah and I've flown out of a pretty solid amount of airports in the US and then I flew out again yeah I got I got home at like midnight last night from Seattle I will say SeaTac is the worst airport hands down in the United States I'm I have objections to that but I've actually it is it. horrible it's an absolute what, what makes there. it so bad what makes it so bad well I've, I've flown out of there four times there's like construction everywhere the people don't know what they're doing everyone's like frantic and freaking out the gates are like two feet away from security so everyone's like log jammed it's horrible and then the traffic when you get in and out and then you land in sfo and it's like ah okay it makes sfo seem really nice I was going to say, if, if SFO seems real, and SFO, like the Harvey Milk Terminal, Terminal 1 is beautiful, like the American Airlines one is gorgeous, like a beautiful terminal. But San Francisco, all, people also associate with delays because there are a lot of delays uh, because of fog and stuff like that. You know what airport sucks, Danny and Joey? Mm, it, Georgia or Atlanta. Actually, never. I've never been to Atlanta. We'll be going this year, though, when the Cowboys play the Falcons, of course. The airport that sucks is LAX. I hate yeah. LAX with an absolute passion. So when I go to Oxnard for training camp, I can promise you I am not flying in LAX. I reckon, I don't know the distance from Oxnard to Orange County, but that airport is elite. The John Wayne, the John Wayne one? The John Wayne, yeah. It is, it's super small. You get in, you get out, it's clean, it's fast. It's amazing. Burbank is actually the one that people fly into for Oxnard because it's a little bit. North. Never been there. Never been there. Neither have I, but I will. Joey, do you have a, yeah, you know what's funny, by the way? I saw a tweet the other day, like, some, someone was like, hey, all Portland is is Seattle if it's not cool, or something like that, which I'm a little biased as an Oregonian, part Oregonian, that, like, Seattle kind of has this uppity elitist mentality about the Pacific Northwest relationship with Portland. But the fact that Seattle has a horrible airport and Portland probably has the best airport mm. in this country, I think they've won best airport three of the last, like, five years or something. Pretty crazy. Anyways... That makes me feel so much better. Um, Joey, do you have any airports that you hate? How's Boston? Is Lo- Logan, is that the one? It is, yeah. That's, yeah. that's pretty pretty impressive. But um, it's fine. Logan. I mean, Logan Airport is like, I don't know. I wouldn't say it's this exceptional airport. I also wouldn't say it's a bad airport. It gets the job done. I'm also not as, I don't think I'm as well-traveled as either of you. I've been to probably like five to ten airports in my that's life. Which, that's pretty good. It's a decent number. It's a decent so, amount, yeah. But it, you guys are talking about all the. I, obviously, you're from California, but you got all these John Wayne airports. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm just not. I'm not that well versed with the, uh, with the airports, you know. But Danny, Danny, have you ever flown out of McConaughey Airport? Uh, no. Where's that? I'm just, just. Oh. Yeah, no. <laughs> the one airport recently that I had a lot of problems with was um, in North Carolina, the Charlotte Airport. It was just the. We were sitting on the tarmac. Were you connecting? Were you connecting out of there? Yes. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Go ahead. Um, we were sitting on the tarmac waiting for. I guess there was some big plane that was just trying to uh, get ready because they were going international. But we were waiting for them. But they were like, "All right, guys, we actually have to move out of the way so another plane could come in and take one of like the." Uh, areas to unload and everything like that and it's like we couldn't just take that one in the 30 minutes we've been waiting here like people were thankfully i had like an hour hour and a half before my other connecting flight some people were like my connecting flight is gonna take off in 15 minutes yeah so that was kind of disastrous but i don't know that could just be a one-time thing i mean that's the only experience i've had with charlotte but that's uh definitely my most sour airport experience charlotte charlotte well known for like just hiccups with because they, they're a very popular connecting destination. Um, but there's just always little hiccups at Charlotte. Like I've it, the airport itself is nice. Um, you know, you get some Bojangles. Have you read Bojangles? So I've heard of it. I've heard really good things. I wanted to stop when I saw the sign, but the line was crazy long and yeah. I had to get in line for my connecting flight. That 
eventually got delayed by like an hour. So I probably could have waited in the line for Bojangles anyway. Yeah, Danny's nickname is uh, Mojangles. Danny Mojangles. Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> I like that. Um, not to uh, not to go off on a Seattle tangent, but have you heard of the San Juan Islands in Seattle? Oh yeah, yeah. Dude, took a ferry there. Amazing. Seattle's amazing. I that's the thing that bothers me is just the way they look down at Portland, which is also awesome. Um, it might be a little yeah. brother complex of mine, but it's fine. Yeah, we went to uh, to dinner last night at the tennis club in Seattle, right on Lake Washington. It is elite. I had no business being there. It's is, so is nice. Danny is Danny Mo considering a, a move to Seattle? Is that what I'm hearing? My wife would love to do that. It is so nice, but I like my job too much, and I would never do that and and all that. But the neighborhoods are super nice, super clean. But I also go when it's sunny out, so I don't see the other side. Yeah, but it's not, it's not, it's over. The Pacific Northwest, like gloom and doom. If you can get over, you just got to accept the fact that there might be a month stretch where you don't really, it's really foggy all day. And like it, but in my opinion, it's always been worth it. All that rain and stuff has been worth it because you go out there like you just did and trees are in full bloom and colors everywhere and the mountains look great and it's worth it. It's so nice. There's a bunch of like water sports on Lake Washington. You see Mount Rainier in the background. It's, Super picturesque out there. The other, uh, the other place I'm trying to convince you to move to is Frisco. I, I saw a Frisco firefighter the other or truck the other day. It had all it was decked out in cowboy stuff. Oh, my and dream! I was like, Danny, Dan, I could, I could just picture Danny Mo Jangles riding on this this Frisco fire engine, and I was like, we got to get, we got to get him and Alyssa out here. We have a but, 49ers flag flying at our station, and it makes me, <laughs> it makes me sick every day. But I'm so outnumbered, like. There's two Cowboys fans out of 70 people. So I clearly at least, just, two, at least you have another one. Yeah, we just hired one. So I have company there. That's awesome. You should get him to we should get him on the How About That podcast sometime. We should. But I'm the lone Mavericks fan in the department. So it's been sad times right now. Yeah, but as Kyrie said, he's been here before. Oh two. Yeah. I think he kind of poked the bear when he said, I thought it'd be a lot louder in here. Yeah, because didn't they? Didn't they? I didn't see the game because I was covering A and M last night um, versus Oregon, which was a crazy game in itself, Super Regional Baseball. But didn't they like put the his quote on the the screen yeah. or something? Yeah, and the crowd went nuts. Yeah, but I'm not worried. It's coming back to Big D for two. We'll tie the series up. Big D for two does not sound good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, we should move on. Yeah. Um, let's move on. A uh, couple of things. It's uh, one welcome back, and you know, keep listening, keep subscribing, sharing all that stuff. Um, you know, I, I, you know, it's kind of a slow time right now, but we're trying to come up with some new things. So we got some cool irons in the fire there, and but we still have some news. Um, we had we just wrapped up mandatory minicamp. CD Lamb was not in attendance. It's done and gone now, and that was not a surprise, but. <laughs> It was the first actual, hey, let me call your bluff move. The first hardball move, per se, because CD lost just over $100,000, which we talked about in the last pod. Not a, not a small amount, even though $100,000 in, compared to $140 million, not that much. Anyways, CD didn't show up. Now we have more. We have about six weeks until training camp starts, and that's when, if a deal is not done by then, Things could get a little hairy. So, Danny, what are your thoughts and hopes for CeeDee Lamb? Do you do you think that the Cowboys get a deal done right before training camp? When when would you envision a deal possibly getting done now that we're kind of in this weird lull right now? Well, I would like to believe that it's going to get done soon, but the track record with the Cowboys is things take longer than most would expect. Um, case in point, the Dak Prescott contract negotiations have been dragged out. Um, But I think this one's a little different. I think it's going to get done. Um, The Justin Jefferson signing has kind of set set some groundwork for what we can expect CeeDee Lamb to get. And we've talked about it. You could say that you could argue CeeDee Lamb is better than Justin Jefferson. I mean, maybe that's a hot take, but they're very comparable players. And I think financially... They're they're similar because... Or it's it's, tough. That's not the craziest take because... Yes, Justin Jefferson's got more yards in three years, but also, and obviously, weird different situation last year. But CD had 
his best year last year. And Justin only had a thousand due to obviously other circumstances. Another thing with that is people always want to justify these big contracts. Good, good, pun. good, what? good pun. Good pun. Just, just in justify. I don't oh, know. Totally accidental, but he's going to have to live up to this contract. And rightfully so. He's the highest paid wide receiver in NFL history. Correct. Yeah. Highest paid non QB. Joey. Yes, yes, I believe so. Which is crazy. And so he's obviously going to have to live up to that contract. But who's under center? It's no longer Kirk Cousins. And say what you want about Kirk Cousins, but he's a gunslinger. He puts up yards and he makes his receivers, Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen when he was there, Jordan Addison. He pads their stats. And now that Justin Jefferson has a rookie quarterback, maybe Sam Darnold, I think his numbers are going to take a step back this year, which is going to be tough. Not to talk too much about Justin Jefferson, but no, no, but that's no, I'm I'm kind of glad. Do you mind if I cut in? I'm glad. No, you please put that up because it, it maybe that's the reason why he signed early, early. Yeah, you know, before CD, he's like, shoot, man, I got 140 here. How do I say no to this? And I'm just not going to drag this out because, to your point, maybe you saw an opportunity to get paid. Yeah, I I just don't see a world in which he matches his production. Post Kirk Cousins, maybe like I don't think the grass is greener now that they moved on from Kirk Cousins. I'm not the biggest JJ McCarthy fan in the world, and I, I don't know if he can support the offense that Justin Jefferson was putting up before. Maybe you have a different take on that, but he just set the record at the wide receiver position, and I think he's going to go backwards. No fault of his own. It's just the situation he's dealt with that team. Yeah, it's tough. Um, and the, I, if we're comparing Justin Jefferson and CeeDee Lamb next year alone, I think the other big factor is, to your point, just adding to it, one of them has a quarterback coming back that they have a great relationship with. The other one, we still don't know who the quarterback is. I, I Last year, there were points where I thought Dak Prescott and CeeDee Lamb felt like a cheat code, how, how dialed in they were. I mean, and obviously, things happen in the playoffs, and that's neither here nor there. But there were moments, I'm trying to think of it, the Lions game, CD and Dak were on one. Um, I don't know even, how many targets he had that game, but it seemed like CD Lamb was literally the only receiver Dak Prescott was looking at. And the defense knew that, and they still couldn't stop him. You know, the, I think the interesting, most interesting thing about CD Lamb last year was I think people tend to forget that there was a point where he had extreme frustration. People, people forget that, well, it was after the 49ers game where he, oh, he had 17 targets in that Lions game. Joey? Yeah, 17 targets. How many catches did he reel in? Do you know off the top of your head? It was like 14? 13 for 222. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's like playing Madden statistics right there. And to your point, at that point in the season, this was, this was not a surprise that Dak Prescott was going to target um, CeeDee Lamb. And I think the fact that Brandon Cooks came back on a little bit at that point, who, by the way, and we're going to talk more about observations later uh, from minicamp, Brandon Cooks just keeps looking good. And I'm... It's not a crazy concept. Obviously, it's on air. It's seven on seven. Brandon Cooks should look good, right? I don't know, man. He looks. I, I after watching him last year and watching him in minicamp, I just see a little bit of difference I, in terms of speed and maybe he's just healthy. And that's what we'll, we'll, we'll see. But Brandon Cooks had come on at that point. Jake Ferguson had really, really come on and certified himself as a top ten tight end in the NFL. That you know, Jalen Tolbert was playing better. So I think. Uh, I, I think that they had other options. They had other people had other things to defend, which definitely helped a little bit. I feel like Brandon Cooks has been like an over, maybe not overlooked, but he's just had such a weird career because he's such a solid, very weird career. And for the most part, he's he's pretty consistent. He's a very consistent wide receiver. When you when you plug in Brandon Cooks in your offense, you know what you're going to get. And so the fact that he's kind of gone from team to team, he I think he gets overlooked. When we're talking about some of the better receivers in the league, I'm not going to sit here and argue that he's a top 10 receiver. That'd be ridiculous. But in terms of number twos, I think he's a pretty good option. He just gets overshadowed by CeeDee Lamb, and rightfully so. He's a top three receiver in the NFL. But I Where think would on you... a, oh, I was going to say, on a different team, is it crazy to say that Brandon Cooks could be the number one no. on a different offense? No, I'm, I mean, off the top of my head, I can't. Like say, oh, in this offense, he's definitely number one. Um, but he's done it before. Who he was New he was New England's number one. Which yeah, who I mean, in Ari- who who's Arizona's receiving core? 
Because uh, Hollywood's Arizona. gone. Didn't they just uh, Didn't they just bring someone in? I don't know, Joey. Could you I, like, for example, that's one that came to my head. I was like Michael Wilson versus Mar- uh, not Martavis Bryant. Uh, uh, Cowboys. God, I'm, draw- I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> All the Cardinals receiving core. Um, Marvin Harrison Jr. Oh, Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, but didn't they sign somebody? I'll look into that. Hmm. But Danny, does this surprise you? Or let me let me ask you this: Where would you guess Brandon Cooks is among active career receiving leaders in the NFL? Active, current active receivers in terms of just yards, yards. Mm, nine. Did you nail it? No, ten. Ah. He's ten. But good for I mean good for you. Here are the here are the guys ahead of him: Julio Jones, DeAndre Hopkins, Mike Evans. Travis Kelsey, Devontae Adams, Keenan Allen, Tyreek Hill, Stephon Diggs, and Amari Cooper. So it's pretty he good has one, he has he's one year older than Amari. For some reason, I feel like Amari has gotten this vibe that he's like older than he is. Um it was it was Zay Jones. So that that's the name that not that he's a world beater, but I did want him to go to Dallas. And it just made no sense to me why he went to Arizona. Like I yeah, that makes sense. Why not? What I mean, I guess, but he'll be the number. More opportunity. Yeah, but would you rather take passes from Kyler Murray or Dak Prescott? Well, that, I think it's irrelevant because it's in Arizona, irrelevant. He, in Arizona, he could be a two. In Dallas, he's competing for three, four slash five. <laughs> hmm. Which, which is a good segue, Dan. Do you, let's let's. This is this has been one of my prevailing thoughts through OTAs and minicamps, and I, I want to. I'm very curious to see what you think. And well, well um, that just shows me Zay Jones has no no desires to win a Super Bowl. <laughs> so I don't want him anyways. Get him out of here. If he doesn't want a ring and he's just chasing the bag, go for it. I don't want him. See? That that is the most one of my favorite things is fan justification. It, it's like it's like like uh, like for example, you know, everyone hates Draymond Green. Non aside from non Warriors. I mean aside from Warriors fans, right? Rightfully so. The moment Draymond Green leaves and signs with another team, they'd be like, hey, you know, I didn't I didn't hate Draymond. And now you know, I'm, I'm stoked to see what he's what he's going to do on our team. That's kind of like that's kind of like Chris Paul with all these Warriors fans. Warriors yeah. fans hated Chris Paul on the Clippers and Rockets. And now they're all about CP3. I know. Funny how that works. But you just did a little justification with the Zay Jones thing. You wanted him. I did. Yeah. So, um. But yeah, good segue. Something that's been on my mind, Danny, through mini camps, OTAs, is obviously we know who the number one receiver for the Dallas Cowboys is going to be. We know who the number two receiver is going to be. We kind of think we maybe know who number three is. Um, but I think one of the, the big takeaways was, and I thought Jalen Tolbert looks more confident, looks good, looked faster, looked a little bit bigger. But I don't think he's just going to be handed the number three receiving job. So one of my big takeaways from minicamp OTAs and my big question moving forward heading into training camp is what does the Cowboys receiving order, and obviously it's more matchup based and it's not just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, in terms of how targets are going to go. But if you were to guess, what would that be? What would it, what would be if you go CeeDee Lamb, Brandon Cooks, then how the rest would it shake out? And I think, to be honest with you, Dan, it's going to be a pretty competitive battle. There's going to be some guys, there's going to be a guy that, does, that doesn't make the team that is going to sign somewhere else, I think, and have a chance to be on that active roster. Yeah, uh, like you said, I think it's pretty obvious who the one and twos are, so that's not really even worth discussing. But that number three spot, I think coming into the year, we all expected that that's going to be Jalen Tolbert's job to lose. And going into training camp, maybe that's the case. He's going to have a leg up on the competition, but is the door open for someone else to take that spot? Absolutely. Um, and I think there's a couple candidates that come to mind. Uh, the first two names that come to my mind are Jalen Brooks, who, from what I hear, people like a lot. Um, we haven't seen a whole lot of him, but the word around camp is he's doing pretty good. He had a really he had a really cool leaping grab for a touchdown on day one of minicamp. Was that with the first or second team offense? First. first. With the first team. From yeah, they were the one thing to note, they were rotating a lot of different guys with the ones too. So just because Jalen Brooks catching passes with the ones doesn't mean that number, you know, number three receiver, right? But impressive touchdown catch looked pretty confident. Anyways. And then if it's not him, I think 
It could be Ryan Flournoy. Again, unproven, a later round pick. The odds are stacked against him, but there's no reason to believe that if he goes and balls out in camp and in preseason, he can't snag that job. I mean, yeah, I I, I think my kind of Florida had a nice had a couple nice plays in mini camp. I'm excited to see what he can do in training camp. He's a guy that obviously will have a lot of eyes on him. I don't think that he's in that conversation yet. But to be honest with you, I also think it's kind of weird because not only like you pinpointed him as a candidate for number like to to impress and be a three or four or five, right? Yeah. I also think that though he's gonna have to compete for a roster spot because behind him, I think there's a lot of other guys too, theoretically behind him. Like, I'll tell you who and this is I wasn't I didn't cover the beat last year. So keep this in mind. I think it's important to say this, right? And maybe this guy is just a seven on seven impressive dude who plays well in the offseason. Tyron Billy Johnson, I walked away and was so impressed by him. Uh just I, I one of those guys where like I like would double take. I'm like, wait, how did this guy not appear in one game last year? And no, he's a guy that was a free agent this offseason. The Cowboys decided to bring back. He's a guy that was given number 13. Um, you know, I mean, that's he, you know, take it for what take that for what it's worth, right? But I mean, this is a guy that has now known the playbook for a year, came in. This is a guy that ran a four two like nine or something, or four four three two or something like that, 40 yard dash. Forgive me for the four two. Um, that was embellishing. But anyways, really, really fast guy. And the one time he actually played actual meaningful time, he looked pretty decent with the Chargers in 2020. So um, long story short, it's, he's this weird combination of like a, an unknown, but also a guy that's now been around the block for a while. I think he's been, and you can double check this, Joey. Um, I think he's been in the league since like 2019, 2018. So you're already coming up on six, seven years. He's bounced around, I think, eight different practice squads. He's a smaller guy, isn't he? He's not that small, though. That's the thing. I think he's like 6'1", I would guess. Just I just without... vision him being like this smaller, shiftier wide receiver. He's definitely thin. Um, yeah, so he's 28 years old, or uh, you know, and he's only played 26 career games. He has 23 career catches for 422 yards. M- almost all of it came in 2020. He had four, 398 yards ca- in, on 20 catches and three touchdowns for the Chargers that season. Um, so he's six, yeah, six one, one ninety three. Um, anyways, a little bit thin, would you know? But it's very speedy, very competitive guy. Um, just on the field, I, I just that's one name. If we're doing names to watch moving forward, I'm so curious to see what he does in the preseason and in training. We also can't forget about Cavante Turpin because I think we just did it again. And I'm uh, very, we always I'm, forget about Cavante, dude. <laughs> he's he's like the forgotten names. Everyone's like, oh, it's going to be CD Brandon Cooks, uh, Jalen Tolbert, and then who? Well, let's not forget Jalen Tolbert is going to have a spot on that roster, and he's suiting up every Sunday. So that's one less spot for one of these guys to compete for because no one's taking that job from him. I'm sorry. That that kick returner spot, I think it's pretty safe to say it's going to be his job. The other two guys that were catching that in min- minicamp that were catching returns were Deuce Vaughn, who was the backup last year too, mm-hmm. um, and Tyron Billy Johnson. So, I mean, to your point, that's Cavante's job. And – uh, and I thought this was interesting. Mike McCarthy brought this up too. From a return perspective, Dan, about 20% of kickoffs were returned, I think, over like the last three years, or maybe it was just last year alone. 20%. The NFL is expecting this to jump to six, over 60%. So do the math. How many plays is that that Kevontae Turpin's going to have the ball in his hands with? It's a lot more. They've almost taken the kickoff like completely out of the game. It's almost become such a non factor because it's like touchback, touchback, touchback. Yeah. And it's become a total snooze fest. So I'm kind are of glad. Excited? What for the? Are you excited for the new rule? Oh, for sure. I mean, I like like with baseball, they changed all the rules. I wasn't a huge fan of it. I like things the way they were, but I also understand like with the NFL, there was a problem. They realized it and they changed it. So yes, I'm a fan of this new kickoff rule because it puts a little more meaning on your special teams and your kickoff unit. And did you ever play? Did you ever play rugby? No. You would have been a good rugby player, Dan. I wanted to. When I came back to SF State, I was going to – because it was like the first time I was going to school as just like just yeah. a student. Like first time in my life. I'm like, I'm just a student. And I thought about it. I was like, should I play rugby? And then I was like, nah. I feel like I tried to talk you into it. Or like I, I remember we had conversations about it. Yeah, I was washed up. I was, I was damaged goods at that point. Yeah. 
I mean, at that point, that that point quote is a little strong because I feel like that, you know, that had happened earlier. But yeah, it's fine. Um, on a different note, speaking of wide receivers, what about a fellow uh, Iowa State Cyclone, Hakeem Butler from the St. Louis Battlehawks? I, I love that you brought that up. I'm, I love that you brought Hakeem Butler up because coming out of day, nowhere. But he go look at what he's done in the XFL the last few years. I, I, I'm blown away that he wasn't on a roster already. I understand, but look what he did in the NFL. It's like, does does this does the switch just flip at some point? Like, you would have thought it would have flipped a while ago, but what, it, maybe he's a late bloomer. I'd argue he hasn't had the chance since I, I he was labeled a bust, and then he's been out of it. And but if you go look at what he's done in spring leagues, he's been incredible. And he's a guy; he's a freak. Can you call a fourth round pick receiver a bust though? Like. What's the realistic expectation of a fourth round wide receiver? I mean, I think it's relative, I would say. Um, because I think that he had a lot of hype for a fourth rounder. I I get. Was he before Alan Lazard or were they teammates, you know? They were teammates because uh Hakeem Butler was there when I was there covering him. Um, but he was only like a freshman or a sophomore. Um so they were teammates at least one year. Um when I so. saw Butler I was like, is that the butler that was a receiver for the Cowboys? Uh, God, what was his first name? Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Wait, say that Say that one more time. The Cowboys had a receiver. His last name was Butler. Was it Josh Butler? No. No, no Josh no. Butler's on the team now. Sorry. He's like, he played for uh, Miami. Uh, played for the Raiders. They got him from the Raiders. Fuck. What was, oh, are you thinking oh, Bryce? Um, was it Bryce Butler? The yes, golfer? yes. Yeah. 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 You know he's like a YouTube golfer influencer now? Really? I know. I gotta he, go was play a solid, he was a solid cowboy. Just solid. He was better than uh, Roy Williams was the one that, not the safety, Roy Williams, the receiver, the one that came over from the Lions. Dude, the, the Lions run of, the Lions run of missing on top end, top pick receivers was so wild. And then, do you remember it got so bad that when the Calvin Johnson draft, that there were people saying like, you can't do it again because you can't have another mess up you can't have calvin johnson jo- join Ro- roy williams and mike williams and charles rogers um sure. wow good thing that they just said you know at fourth times to charm on that one <laughs> could you what's imagine crazy? if they said you know what we're, we don't want to do it again we're gonna go take i don't know whoever what's crazy about him is i feel like he still had like five good years left in him when he retired he he and patrick willis were the two guys because they retired they were mm-hmm. came in the league similar time and then they retired similar times <laughs> Where you're like, oh my god, like, what, what happened? But I think one thing that like f- reporters, fans, people on the outside just don't really understand is just how much little pain and honestly big things that players play through all the time. Darren Waller was talking about last year; he had a major health scare, and obviously he retired, you know, recently this week um, or this past week. So, uh, you know, and I, I, I think that you know guys like Willis and Calvin Johnson are like, you know what, might as well, you know, preserve my body a little bit. You know, and still, both of them still end up in the Hall of Fame. So there you go. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I. It kind of hurt to see him retire because he was. I think he went out at like the top of his game. He was still like a top five receiver when he retired. Yeah, which is kind of hard to see, but you totally understand why because you see what it can do to people. Yeah, he's dude. Calvin CJ was amazing, man. Um, Georgia Tech for a team that had was a triple option offense had a wild run of good receivers. Demarius Thomas, Calvin Johnson. I feel like there's one more, too, that I'm just not thinking of at the top of my head. Mm. I would have to brainstorm a little bit to think about that one. Brandon Marshall was UCF, not Georgia Tech, even though it, it's similar colors. But Not a not a wide receiver, but a running back to Shard Choice. He was a yellow was jacket. Good, doing great stuff at UT. I so. think uh, uh, Georgia Tech went away from that gimmicky offense, they right? Yeah. They did. Gimmicky? Don't you dare call the triple option gimmicky. Get with the t- I mean, get with the times. Come on. I'm a big believer that, you know, it, it's the great equalizer. You know, if you, if you don't have a good QB, just, just run the triple option and hope your defense can make some plays. You're going to tell me you can't find a good quarterback in the greater Atlanta region? That's a football talent hotbed. Danny, how many good quarterbacks are there in college football? Mm. 25? There's a difference between being good in college and good in the NFL. Like, there's so many guys that are just good college quarterbacks. Joey, can you ask Shahan next time you're on the Survivor Show, just off the top of that, how many good quarterbacks are there in college football? I'm just curious. 
Oh, I mean, I, I can ask him right now. I'll just see what he says. There's a yeah, lot of text him, text him right now and just be like, how many good quarterbacks are there in college football? There's a lot of good quarterbacks. There's not a lot of NFL prospects, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, for sure. That's what I'm saying, like 25. But there's also a bunch of mediocre. I, I think my hot take, if, if you have a very mediocre or below average QB, just triple option, play action, run that into oblivion and, 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 and play defense. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, shout out yeah. to Mike Leach, but I think the air raid is the way to go in college. Yeah. Well, I think people forget about the air raid. It's an extension of the run game anyways. So they throw the ball a lot, but it's to get the ball in your playmaker's hands. So. How many triple option teams are left? Air Force and South Alabama still triple option? Maybe. I don't think so. They no, used no. to be. No. Not South Alabama. Uh, yeah. You're making Joey pull his hair out. That's how he's, he's, he's freaking out over there. <laughs> Good college talk. I think there's more than. I mean, isn't Navy? Is Navy still triple? Oh, yeah, that's the obvious one. Yeah. Kind of, well, but, no, but like not as much. I feel like both of them not as much. I, I think they know. still do. I mean, they still do, but it's just not as much. That's their whole um, offense. Yeah. Um, trivia for or not trivia question for both of you. When NCAA 25 comes out, two part question: One, will you have a life for a week? And two. What is your starting team? Hmm. Well, do you, want, do you want me to do you want me to go first? You ask the question, then you want to answer it. I think you I think your answer is fairly obvious as to who you'll. No, answer. I'm not. Why would I go with Oregon? Because you're you went to Oregon. No, but that's not fun because they're so good and they have so much recruiting capability in terms of NIL and in terms of jerseys. That wouldn't be fun. Wait, that's are, like, you, oh, are you talking, you, you made it sound like it's a play now thing. I, I didn't know you were talking about a dynasty team. No, no, we're talking dynasty. Oh. Like we're talking about building a dynasty. Oh, yeah. UMass? That's a good one. Yeah, you you have that excuse because UMass. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to, to be this guy, Joey, but you know, started from the bottom and they're still there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably always will be. Um. If we're talking dynasty, yeah, don't do OU. Come on, no, I'm, you just said we're going dynasty. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I, like, would, I, I people would be like, oh, I'm going to do Texas. It's like, no, 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 no. I'd go with uh, Arizona. I'd go with the Wildcats. That's a, a Big Twelve school, huh? That sounds so weird. I know, but I think they're on the up. T Mac, you've seen T Mac, the wide receiver they have, Tracy Before McGrady. It? <laughs> yeah, to Troy McMillan, he's like six five, six six. No, he's, oh yeah, yeah. He's, do they keep? Um, do they also keep Fafita? No, they Fafita. Did. Yep. Dude, I mean, those are you had a star quarterback and receiver right off the gate. Mm. Didn't who was their quarterback that got hurt and then transferred? You're, you're thinking of the the running the the guy that was like also in the Heisman talk for a while with yeah. know, a couple of, a couple of years ago. Started with a K. Cleo Tate. Tate. <laughs> I didn't think you were going that far back. No, 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 no. The, the, he was the quarterback for Arizona. They got hurt, and then this guy came in and took his job and never gave it back. Whoever the starter about. was before Fafita. I don't know what you're talking about, then. Yeah, I don't know. I, I thought you guys knew college football. It says the guy asking the question. You got to look up Arizona like two years ago. Uh, all right, Joe, you can get on that. Um, you know who I – so I, I, I just remember this as we were talking about it. The team I went for in NCAA 14 always was Idaho. The, the the Kibby Dome, you know, the indoors, Vandals. the Vandals, the black and the black and gold, and I love that. But I forgot because they're I think they're independent now. They're not in the game. What? So yeah, they're or they're the like FCS. They're not in the game. So how do you know that? I'm looking at the confirmed list of teams right now. Is anyone else left off? Well, because they're I, I think they might they might not be an FBS team anymore either. They might now be an FCS team. That might be part of it. I don't I don't don't quote me on that. Um, but so I had to, I had to rethink who I was going to do and I got to go with James Matt. You got to go with James Madison as your starting team, huh? The, the mm -hmm. Dukies. That's a good call. I feel like yeah. that, uh, that school has like committed so much money to their sports program recently. James Madison. Yeah. Their, their basketball team's legit. Their football them team. And, them, and Grand, them and Grand Canyon. GCU. Yeah. Okay. GC's okay. One. What? Jaden Delora was the quarterback. But he had he had some stuff. 
Oh, Joey found it before me. Sorry, I didn't even see that. <laughs> Joe, define good for when you say good college quarterback. Oh, is that what Shahan's wondering? Yeah. Um, better than serviceable. All right. Better than serviceable. So solid, you know, that's kind of what I'm going for. Better than serviceable. Yeah, because I think people who are not, who are just serviceable, that goes to my point of like, just run, run the triple option. Well, that's, that's the bar. That sets the bar extremely low. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, how many? That that's that's the point I'm making. It'll be interesting to see this conference realignment. It's going to take some years to get used to. Yeah, you you, you don't think uh, you think Oregon <laughs> Rutgers is gonna is not going to be uh, easy to understand <laughs> right off the bat. It's like a travel nightmare. Like I know. When you think yeah. about it, you're yeah. going coast to coast. For like half your games, poor poor Oregon's like other sports that like can't play Oregon State now, which is thirty minutes away, and they got to go all the way to Piscataway, like it's insane. Or UC, UCLA and USC going to Rutgers, or or even like Iowa, you know what I mean? It's just Washington going all the way to you know Indiana constantly. So money's taking over. Yeah. All right, back to Cowboys. Um, Danny, we talked a little bit off air about this um but the offensive line i think it's so interesting with like mini camp and otas and stuff with rookies from when you hit when your most important picks are on the line right because there's there's not a lot of hype on aside from like the off the field stuff that tyler guyton and cooper bb have been able to do by the way quick plug go to lone star live and you'll see a long feature on cooper bb i wrote um Danny, perhaps the best description I've ever heard of a player was that he's a cinder block with a ping pong ball for a head. It is pretty accurate. I don't know if it was like the pads that he wore at Kansas State or like or what it was or like the spatted ankles. He just looked gigantic. He looks huge. I don't I don't know if he looks that way in person and I don't know if he's any bigger than Zach Martin, but he just looks like two Zach Martins next to each other. That's how wide this man looks. He, I think we, we've mentioned this podcast before, but I think he has Jonathan Hankins uh, upper body where like they're just wide. Like it's not, and they, and I think pads, it, the, there's like a defining of like the shoulder height with pads sometimes that make them look this way, but wide. <laughs> That's yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and I think, one of you or both of you guys said that I was crazy for saying that their O line could be better in 2024 than it was last year. But here, let, yeah, go ahead. But then this is where, yeah, you're going to try and fight me on this, but I'm going to stand behind this. I said this from day one. I'll say it again. I saw this servicing on Twitter that losing Tyler Biotish, while his time as a cowboy was who's good, he had some bright moments. He was a liability in the run game. Against, that's a little. That's a little strong. But go ahead. I I I don't know. You watch the amount of times he would get bull rushed into the backfield, and our running backs, whether it be Tony Pollard, whether it be Rico Dattle, the few carries Deuce Vaughn got, these guys were getting hit in the backfield. And I think teams realized if you put a big one technique or just slide someone over to go head up on Tyler Biotish, you can put him on ice skates in the run game. So take him out, send him to Washington, insert. Cooper Beebe or Brock Hoffman or Brock Hoffman, not out of the realm of possibility. No, I think you could see a step up in the run game. Obviously, Tyler Guyton is not Tyron Smith at left tackle, but I think in the overall run game, I don't know if you're going to see that as an apparent weakness right away. So responding to your, that point you made first liability felt strong for running game for Tyler Biotish. I don't think he was, that was, I don't think he was good. It wasn't a strength. Yeah. was not a strength. No, was not a strength. But at the end of the day, I think Tyler Biotish is a top 15 to 10 or 10 center in the NFL. 10 is no, there's no way. 15 to 10. I'm saying like, for me, he's probably more 15, right? But I guarantee you find with, because what he was able to do from a communication standpoint in the pass blocking game, I think you might find some people that, you know, might be bullish on him in terms of that regard, right? And they might overlook the running game stuff. Regardless, say he's 15, he was a fit top 15 center in the NFL. You're asking a rookie day one 
to be a top 15 center in the NFL. Or Cooper Brock Hoffman. But Cooper Beebe's not – well. Or bro, I feel like we're just handing the job to BB, which no, I know Brock. I, it's one thing I've been. We keep forgetting about Cavante, and I think we got to keep stop forgetting about Brock Hoffman too. You know the thing with Cooper BB and and, and, you're, back. and you're calling him a rookie, which he is. He's a rookie, but he's a rookie that comes with so much experience against big time competition and big time games. Like this is a seasoned veteran coming in as a. I mean, yes, he's still quote a rookie. But I don't think the he's, gonna, he's not going to shy away from the bright lights. I don't think he's going to be overmatched. I don't think he's going to be overwhelmed, which is why I think this transition could be pretty seamless to center. And if you talk to if you see what his his college coach said too, he agreed um, because he played tackle and guard, and tackle on both sides, guard on both sides, and yeah. To me, this could be a weird analogy, but this is how I look at the Tyler Biotta situation in Dallas. It's like when you're in. A relationship, you want to tell yourself that everything's great. Like you don't really see what other people see. And then once the relationship's over and you take that step back and kind of look at what it was, you're like, wow, that wasn't that good. And so now that he's moved on, we have someone new. You see all this stuff and like maybe we weren't that secure at the center position the whole time. Does that make sense? No, it does. But to continue the analogy, um, and I'm not speaking from experience in this at all, but um, when that fades and all of a sudden the new options are not working out as well, then that one person, you start saying, you start remembering even a better light. So my, my point being in that analogy, someone's still going to have to be a top 15 center in the NFL on this roster to, to make not, think, not make you think overly fondly about the Tyler Biotish experience. How Big of an ask is that to be a top half of the league center. Like if we were to list all 32 centers, which I don't have memorized, obviously, but if you're number 16, like, is that really even that good of a center? So I don't think you're asking the world of BB, of Brock Hoffman, of Bass, whoever it's going to be. I don't really think you're asking all that much to match last year's production at the position or take a step forward. I think there is a vast room for improvement there. And I think that's where we disagree. I think you're underestimating the, how, what it takes to be a top 15 center. I'm not saying that Cooper BB can't do it or Brock Hoffman or TJ Bass, right? Um, I think they could. I, I just also think it's not a guarantee. And that's kind of my point. Um, and back to kind of the original thing that started this, and I want to talk more about this with you. It's interesting because mini camp in OTAs, right? If you're a QB, there's murmurs of, oh, Bo Nix is looking really good, right? (laughs) If you're a running back, it's like, man, Bucky Irving can move. If you're a wide receiver, it's like, have you seen what Roma Dunze looks like? You know, I mean, with Keenan Allen, he's going to look great. You know, whatever. My point being, with skill position guys, it's really easy to tell. Linemen, not (laughs) even. There's not a lot of hype aside from, like, what they're doing off the field. And Mike McCarthy, who, by the way, is not just, like, a hype, a guy that hypes up people randomly. He has pointed to the fact that Cooper Beebe and Tyler Guyton and Nate Thomas have been very impressive in how they've reached out to other linemen. I talked with Terrence Steele about this, and he said that he was really impressed by just how many questions they're asking and how involved they are. And then once he heard the fact that Guyton and Beebe were like working out together on their own already, and Nate Thomas, like that's been very impressive to him. So off, you know, that's where the hype's coming from. But on the field, what did we see from those guys working with the twos and? doing seven on seven and just drill stuff, right? So no hype, hype, choo-choo train from on the field perspective. We'll wait till training camp for that to happen. But I think it's just interesting, Danny, that when you draft a lineman, you don't really know how good they're going to be until you actually put on the pads in training camp. Yeah, I mean, what what can you see from a lineman blocking against air, blocking against a sled? Not a whole lot. We'll see a lot when the pads come on. and. Things start getting a little nasty in there. We'll see who, who's going to earn the spots. But, yeah, right now, you really can't tell. You're just kind of basing everything off of what they did in college. At least I am. Um, yeah. I mean, what they do in the weight room, uh, that's cool. A lot, of, a lot of linemen can bench 400 pounds. But what they're going to do when the pads come on is going to be a different story. I, I just think it's unique, too. And, and I think one thing that's interesting, if you look at why – actually, let me ask this, Dan, just from your perspective. Why did the Cowboys' offensive line struggle last year in the run game? What would you guess? 
I would say from what I saw, they were not winning the line of scrimmage, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. They were constantly in the backfield. They weren't getting movement up front, and they weren't generating a lot of holes. That's what I saw. No, Not so much the pass pro, the run blocking. So one reason that they pointed to as a reason why it wasn't the best year for him last year, well, personally, Zach Martin said that, you know, the – that he said that not not being in training him fully actually affected him a little bit last year, um, which I thought was interesting. And one of those things that like you think that's the case, but then players will often be like, no, 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 it's not. That wasn't it. But it's good. It was good to hear him kind of like, yeah, no, for sure, it was tough because it's understandable. Um, but another reason that the offensive line wasn't up to full potential last year was they just didn't think that they had enough snaps together. Um, you know, because first two weeks, Tyler Smith's out. Second two weeks, Tyron Smith. Remember, then there was the game against Arizona where they had three starting offensive linemen out. Long story short, yeah. yeah, And then in training camp, Zach Martin wasn't there the whole time. Tyron Smith, you know, during the season had to practice, you know, was doing walkthroughs and stuff. But long story short, one of the big things the offensive line talks about constantly is this idea is five is one, right? Five offensive linemen working together is one. And I think it's really interesting from a rookie standpoint that they're not even going to get a chance to do that, to get the five as one with their probable starters for a while. You know what I mean? Like, like to be, to, you know who's starting at left tackle right now, Dan? Who? It's your favorite. Oh, Edoga? Yeah. Starting at left tackle. So that means, I mean, I guess that makes sense. You can't, you can't give Tyler Guyton the keys to the car from day one just because he was the first round pick. You have a guy that's been around the NFL for a good amount of time and he's making, okay money. So I guess it makes sense to give him the first shot. I don't see that lasting very long. I think Tyler Guyton's going to take that seat coming up here pretty soon, but I do like how they're making the rookie earn it, even though he was the first round pick. Nothing is but, given. No, I know, but what are the odds that, that Shuma Doga is starting over Tyler Guyton week one? Same odds I win the lotto. So, so very high. No, slim. Eh. Um, but that goes back to my point, and I asked Terrence this, like, how do you how does an offensive line likes to work together as five as one build the appropriate chemistry when one starter and potentially two are not with them in the starting line? And he, you know, he brought a good point. He's like, honestly, that's something we have to work at constantly with everyone because injuries happen. <laughs> so I better have our five as one better be 10 as one, which makes sense. But still, there's something to be said about actually working together. And I don't the way that it went in minicamp, I'd be shocked if Tyler Guyton and Cooper Beebe opened as the starting working with the f- first teamers day one of training camp, right? No, but I think as the old saying goes, the cream rises to the top, like talent prevails. Those are some very talented players. And I think it's just gonna work itself out in the end. Um, you talk about building like that crew cohesion, having that five up front, learn to play together, communicate together, all that stuff. Well, it's a blessing and a curse to have the competition during preseason is because you're not going to have that established five. You have, let's just say, three spots locked up to start. Yeah. Is that, is that fair to say? No, oh, yeah. Three, yeah. 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 And then the other, guard, the, other, yeah, yeah, the, the other two spots are going to be competing all preseason. So, But again, do you really need that cohesion built by week one? No. You need that cohesion built for November, December when I think your O-line – can win and lose ball games when the weather's not as great, when you have to lean on your running game, when you have to manage the clock, slow the game down, keep your defense off the field. That's when they're going to lean on that unit. And while I think this was one of the least sexy drafts the Cowboys have had in a long time, it was arguably not, one of the not most, according to Jerry Jones. Yes, but it was arguably one of the most productive and need based drafts. So, yeah, but my, and this is my last point. Without that, I wonder, my, it's a question for me, the, the cohesion, the, the chemistry, early on, right? And again, mm-hmm. to your point, maybe later in the season, you work all that stuff out. There's some pivotal games pretty early for the Cowboys. And uh, Dan, have you seen who's going to be on the D-line week one? No. Uh, one, Miles Garrett. Uh, oh, yeah. So, long story short, from a cohesion standpoint, I think it would be really important um, early on. So... We'll anyway. see. I mean, I would I would hate to have to have Tyler Guyton line up week one against Miles Garrett, but you know damn well that defense is going to scheme him up to find himself across from a rookie left tackle starting week one. So it's going to be sink or swim. 
Um, you can always have your tight end in a chip, but that is arguably one of the toughest week one matchups you can have for a rookie left tackle is it, the toughest. That's the, that's the ultimate welcome to the NFL right there. Here's miles Garrett, protect your franchise quarterback, which I'm assuming by then they just made one of the highest paid quarterbacks in the NFL history. Go keep them upright. Good luck. That'll be a challenge. Um, so Shahan texted back to Joey saying he'd say 20 probably with a question mark with 20 or 30 more who possibly could be. So f- let's say 50 quarterbacks in D1 that are like above serviceable, right? So that's, a, that's about 75 other QBs that are serviceable slash not good. Mm-hmm. I think there should be more option teams. That's my point. The option's fun, but also seeing 55 to 60 points is a lot more fun too. So, Man, no, I, I like a grind out. I like a grind out college football game. Um, all right, well, we got to get going. We got to bounce soon. Danny, anything else on your mind? Did you pick a, did you pick a college team? No. No. You, didn't you, you guys cut me off. I said Arizona. Oh, you did say Arizona. Arizona's my team. Watch out for the Wildcats in 2024. You, hear, you heard it here first. Big 12 champs? <laughs> it's possible. Boston. Not Utah? Not, not, not Oklahoma State? No. Fafita wow. and the boys are going to win it all. V5 Fafita, huh? You heard it here first. Clip that one. Um, big, big 12, right? No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah big, big 12 champs. Arizona Wildcats. Boom. All right. Anything else in your mind? Uh, not a whole lot right now. I just got back from vacation. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> right Damn. back into work tomorrow. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for your firefighting service. Um, really quickly before we go, really quickly, Joey did send us a video of him with a grocery cart, as we asked on the last pot. And I was very appreciative. And I was like, oh, he's going to actually bring it back and be a good Samaritan. No, Joey sent a video and he left a cart right behind someone's car, just as we thought. He's a terrible human being and you should throw tomatoes at him if you see him in person. Not only did he leave it in the parking lot, he pushed it against someone's bumper. So Someone's bumper. Some poor souls. And I told so him next time, the next, next time, time it's it's getting stacked on top of a car next time. I don't so know. Like, you might have some uh, some crazy New Englander come and put a beating on you. Be careful. I'll be quick, quick and efficient. Four shopping <laughs> carts will be on their car before they even notice. I don't know, man. When the, when the Celtics lose in seven, it's going to be pretty sad around there. Tensions might be high, so watch yourself. All right. Well, you know, if that happens, maybe I uh, I'll be a little more careful about that. All right. uh, Mavericks in seven, Arizona Wildcats, 2024 Big 12 champs. All right, who's winning, who's winning the World Series? Dodgers, obviously. Come on. Psych. Nothing yeah. about the Cowboys, huh? Well, that's obvious. They're obviously going to win. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Forgot I don't me. need to say that. I don't yeah. need to say that. Hmm. Well, why don't you put your money where your mouth is, Dan? Marshawn Nealon leads the league in sacks. Cowboys win the Super Bowl. Marshawn good- Nealon leads the league in sacks? Miles Garrett, who? Oh God! What about All right. All right, we gotta, we gotta. Go. All right, cut me off. I'm done. Cut him off. Come off. We're cutting everyone off. off. That's another episode of How About That Podcast. We'll see you later. Thanks for listening to How About That Podcast. 